Hey everybody, today I'm talking about Tekenyu, which is a one to four player board game by Board and Dice Games. Uh, this one is designed by Dan Daniele Tashini and David Turtsy, who happen to be two designers I, hide, I hold in very high regard. Um, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours of play. Um, if you're familiar with those designers, then you're probably aware that they've made quite a few games, or particularly Tashini has um, made games in this vein where they've got these very hard to pronounce names beginning with the letter T. Um, you've got Zolkin, you've got um, Teiru Teiru Khan, Trismegistus, and now Tekenyu. Now, if I was to put them in a weighting category in terms of how com complex they are, I would say this one is marginally, you know, fractionally more complex than um, Teiru Teiru Khan, but quite a bit less um, involved than something like Trismegistus. So second of the kind of fourth well, two out of four in terms of its complexity. Um, the or, or much like two other or the other of those games as well. This one is dice driven, so it's a dice drafting game where you're going to be taking turns taking a die from a common pool and um, using them to take actions and um, so on. But the way you're going to be drafting those die is going to be quite different to anything else out there because you've basically got this um, obelisk on the board and that obelisk is going to be divided into, or it's going to be stood on a disc and, they, and that disc is going to be divided into six kind of sections and at any one time um, two of those sections are going to be in, in the light, two of them are going to be in the shadow and two of them are going to be in the shade. And the importance of that is because depending on where that light is facing, it's going to depend on how the different dice in the game are kind of classified. Because you've got, I think, five different colors of dice. You've got the black, the white, the brown, the yellow, and the gray. And um, again, depending on where they are in that lighting, depends on whether they are pure dice, they are tainted dice, or they are forbidden dice. Now, the forbidden dice are quite simple. You're not gonna be able to use them at all. So they're gonna be unobtainable for as long as they are in that type of lighting. But the other two is quite important because you've got this most background thought you've got to go through um, in terms of keeping your tainted and your pure dice balanced because having the more balanced of the two by, by the time it comes to a certain round in the game is going to give you benefits in terms of becoming um, first player in the future rounds because obviously in a dice drafting game you want to be the first to take your dice because um, you know you want to get the ones that you really want. Um, so yeah that's that's a quite interesting concept because you've got the scale on your own player board and obviously when you're taking a pure dice you're putting it on the light side when you're taking a, uh, a tainted dice you're going to put it on the dark side. Um, additionally if you take too many dark dice or tainted dice um, at the end of the round you are going to lose points as well so again just more things to think about. So the colour is important in, in that regard, but also the pit value is important because it can dictate the strength of the actions you can take because in each of those six sections are kind of related to a different god power or a god action you can take. And I suppose in, in theory, they're all kind of these separate mini games that synergize in, you know, in, in, in ways throughout the game. So you've got one section which is almost like an engine building style section where you uh, have to pay um, brick resources or, or blackstone resources in order to place your statues on the board. And those statues can go on the different kind of um, hex spaces on the, um, on the obelisk wheel. And then whenever you or another player takes that action, then you'll get a little bonus such as getting a gold, which is like a wild resource or, or something like that. So you can kind of um, generate a bit of an engine as the game goes on. Um, also, you're going to get points for getting more of your statues out um, in a kind of a set collection style method, which is, which is um, uh, you know, uh, another way to get quite a lot of points. Um, you've got another section as well, which I think is one of the most dominant sections of the game, where you're placing these kind of columns on this grid or a temple, I think it's called. I think it's a five by five grid, um, and you are essentially trying to um, pay resources, take a tile. Um, and put it on this grid and when, whatever kind of grid space you're covering, you're going to get the resources of which you're covering um, and, and so on. And that can give you points down the road um, based on how many kind of cross sections you, you um, line up to get points with buildings, which corresponds to a different section where you're spending food in order to place one of your buildings from your player board onto that temple um, or around the temple. And then for them, you're going to kind of take every resource depending on the line or column that you're going to you're going to line that up to. So you can get like a, a stone, a, you know, a white stone, a black stone, a bit of food, um, and so on, um, which which is quite nice. Something I should have said as well is when you place these um, place those columns onto the board, you are trying to, or you can adjust them, and you're trying to line the colours up to the different borders in order to get more points, which is somewhat kind of reminiscent of Table Table Khan by kind of matching up the um, matching up the symbols on the pyramid, if you're familiar with that game. Um, the, there's kind of a, the pit value is somewhat important as well because 
I said the you're kind of fit or, or restricted to certain tiles you can take when you're placing those columns um, because you know if you place a five or a six you're going to be able to take one type of um of kind of stand to put your column on uh, whether it's a three or four it's going to be another one or a one or two it's going to be another one but if you're taking those higher pit values you're going to get more points um, in return for doing so um, additionally the more bread you pay when you're playing a bit placing a building can put you in the more kind of lucrative spots on the board which is going to give you more potential to line up more more points as the game goes on um, another region is based on um, basically it's, I think it's like a quarry so you've got all this kind of this whole almost like a chart of different resources you can take um, but when you are when you pay um, happiness which is another kind of currency in the game because you've got like a population track and a happiness track and um, when you pay happiness you are going to take one of your buildings and put it on one of these different um, rows depending on the pit value you've taken and it's going to give you um, a resource, a resource um, of one of the types of resources but it's also going to increase your capacity for holding those resources because um, throughout the game on your player board you have got a track of how many different resources you can keep of a certain type so um, out, out of the you know the food the white the white rock the black rock and um, I think it's papaya paper you can or you know you're limited to how much you can store because at any time you can use any of the dice colors um, which correspond to a different resources in order to take that many that many resources so for example if i took used a three yellow die um, i could use that to get three um, papaya paper whereas if um if, if my capacity was only two then out of those three pips i could only keep two of them and then the one left over would have to go on my negative side of the scale so being greedy can be um, punishing um, in, in subtle ways, um, but there's going to be times where you're going to be a bit more free and open to do what you want to do in terms of getting the resources you want. Um, and additionally, um, kind of the higher you are up in each of these tracks, you're going to kind of um, get resource, uh, get points at every scoring phase, depending on who's got, kind of got that tiebreaker, who's, who's got the most buildings on each column, and um, you know, if it's the same, who's got the highest building on each column. And um, that's going to be a way to get a lot of resources. Um, additionally, there's going to be a huge card row at the bottom, which corresponds to a different god action. Um, and you are going to pay, um, kind of charge yourself papaya in order to take one, two, or three cards, um, depending on the pit value. Um, you know, if you use a one or a two, I think you can take one card from a section of, um, of, of cards. Um, if you pay, I think it's, I can't remember how many papaya, in order to get two cards or three cards, depending on if you paid a three or four or a five or a six dice. Um, and it lets you take one, two or three cards. Uh, and the cards are quite interesting. You've got kind of um, action cards or kind of instant cards that you can kind of cash in and do things straight away. Um, you've also got um, technology cards, which with a lot of Tashini games you've, you've got in terms of getting permanent powers throughout the game. So, you know, whenever you take a certain action, you might get a few points or another resource or something like that. So you can get a, another bit of an engine going there. And finally, you've got your, um, your end game scoring points as well, because um, obviously as you go on, you're going to want to work towards something at the end of the game to get a big point, bunch of points um, at the end. Uh, additionally, you've got a, um, a, a population track which is somewhat important because um, not only are you going to get points for, um, basically on that population track, you've got two different markers. You've got a population marker and you've got a happiness marker. The popular population marker basically is your, your limit to how much happiness you can have. But the, the happiness marker can get you points depending on how far up the track you get and also dictates how or how many cards are available to you. Because when you take that card action, you are restricted to how far you up how far you are up the um, up the happiness track and if you're really far high up then you're going to get options of a whole bunch of cards and kind of give you a lot more flexibility a lot more freedom to take the cards you want and need at that time it's somewhat rem reminiscent of um, Terra Mara um, if you're familiar with that game where depending on how high, how far up the track you are you're going to have more options available to you and that is essentially um, essentially the game um, is bouncing all those different things I'm trying to get points in all different ways. Um, every second round or every two dice drafts, you are going to rotate the obelisk. Every four dice drafts, you are going to have a kind of a preliminary round where you um, where you weigh up your scales and um, new player order will kind of be um, determined. And then every eight rounds is going to be a scoring round. And when it's a scoring round, you're going to score, as I said, based on who's got the most um, buildings in each quarry. You're going to get three points for each of those. You're going to score points based on how many 
um, how many pillars you've got in relation to how many buildings or statues you've got around the temple um, and you can get a lot of points that way. You're also going to score points based on how many statues you've got on the board and um, also as you're placing buildings down you're going to have to bear in mind that the more buildings you place you are going to have to pay a certain food cost um, to turn, or depending on how many buildings you've got down. So, And if you can't pay those buildings or pay that food cost you're going to lose points. So that's something you're going to have to bear in mind with a lot of um, Tashini games and you're going to have to feed your people um, which is cool. And that's going to be basically how the game's going to play out. You're going to play another, another eight turns and then it's going to be final scoring where in addition to scoring those scoring criteria you're also going to score your final um, scoring cards. So, as I said, it's, it's somewhat of, of lots of mini games mixing together, um, balance it or kind of managing your resources, um, how you're going to be as efficient as you can with your dice drafts, knowing when dice are going to be um, tainted and when they're going to be pure. Um, you've additionally got these um, scribe markers, which are quite important because they let you manipulate your, um, your die values up or down by up to two, um, which can also be useful depending on if you want those high pip values or lower pip values. But additionally, if you spend two of those scribe markers, then you're going to get to take a whole extra bonus turn, which can be extremely powerful. And in addition to that, those, those dice that you, that you draft without or by spending those um, scribe tokens are not going to count towards your scales, so that they, you're not going to have to worry about taking a, a tainted dice and uh, potentially losing points because it's not going to be taken into consideration, which is quite cool. Um, but yeah, that I suppose in a lot of ways, um, a lot of the separate mechanisms are quite um you know there's nothing overly original there but that whole the whole key concept of being the tainted the pure and the forbidden dice is completely fresh and also that scale mechanism is great as well i really do like that and it just adds that extra wrinkle in terms of what you're thinking about when drafting the certain dice uh, obviously there's lots of meaningful decisions here um you know managing your resources can be quite tight um you know every or everything's going to cost resources. Um, you've got to be careful about when you take resources not to be greedy because it's going to count towards your negative scales. You're going to be increasing your capacities for carrying these resources. You're going to be getting your statues down, um, not only to get you points, but also to get you those bonuses when other people are taking those actions. You want to be the first to get the good cards. You want to get your happiness up. So there's a lot of strategies to take, lots of paths of getting points and, um, and so on. So yeah, lots of to think about as you'd expect with a Toshini game. Um, and you know, this one fits that build very, very well. So um, if you're looking for something that's going to give you a lot to think about, it's going to stretch you in lots of different directions, then um, you're not going to be disappointed. Balance of the game as well. I mean, all the different strategies seem, um, or from my experience, there's nothing that's alarming to me. I mean, they all seem pretty well, um, well balanced. Um, there's not going to be a runaway dominant strategy that's going to shaft another player. Uh, so I do like that. Um, mechanically, as I said, um, there's some, there's some obtuse ways the game plays out. I mean, a lot of, there's quite a lot of rules thrown at you at once, and I think, I think. Initially, it can be somewhat overwhelming and you're probably going to need a game or maybe two games to get the the, the flow of the game out of your system or, or just, you know, in, ingrained in you because, you know, when you explain some of every two rounds the obelisk moves, every four rounds there's going to be a mat phase, which when you weigh up your scales, every eight rounds there's going to be a scoring phase. Uh, you know, it's going to be it's somewhat daunting at first, but when you get playing the game, it's not too bad. I mean, it, you're not going to be overwhelmed with, with decisions, um, even though there is a lot to juggle. Um, time investment wise, you know, it's going to sit in that hour and a half to two hour time frame um, with an original rules explanation to someone who's not played the game. It might go more towards that two hours, um, but I think it's more than warranted because it is quite a heavy game. There's quite a lot going on in it. And, um, you know, it's not going to be just a, a filler game. It's going to be your main event of the night. So, um, you know, the time investment is quite good. Um, the the only thing is in terms of downtime, um, I think initially the the housekeeping can be somewhat fiddly um, because obviously whenever that um, obelisk is moving, all the dice are going to adjust in their positions on the on the tainted pure or forbidden scale. So once you get the the kind of system around in your head about which which die sits where, depending on the shadow or, or the shade or the light, um, it's going to flow a lot quicker. But initially, it can be a bit a bit fiddly depending on where they sit. But as I said, you you will get over that quite quickly. Um, in in addition, I think there's a, a whole lot of housekeeping to worry about. I mean, when you when you take cards, you refresh them. When you when you take these um, you know the plinth tiles to put the columns down, you're going to just refresh them and shuffle them down. 
Um, and yes, yeah, so there's not actually a whole lot of housekeeping to consider other than constantly, as I said, changing those dice around. So downtime isn't too bad. And um, the only other thing is if, if players do kind of use uh, a main action and then use their bonus um, rar action by spending those two, two um, scribes, then you're gonna have to wait a couple of turns before you get your go. And obviously if that's a four player game, then that could potentially be quite a few goes. But, um, but nothing too, too daunting. Um, interaction wise, there is some good tension, obviously with dice drafting games, um, there's always gonna be um, tension and getting the dice you want. But I think in, in comparison to a lot of other dice drafters, this one is quite loose, it's somewhat forgiving because there, there are quite a few die on, or dice on the, um, on the board at once. Um, as the game develops, it's gonna get somewhat, um, dwindled down somewhat, but still, there's, there's gonna be options pretty much available most of the time. Um, but they're, they're obviously, depending on the player count as well, those statue spots are gonna be somewhat limited. Um, so there is tension to get those spots because not everybody's gonna get those bonuses. Um, getting the quarry spots you want is gonna be, um, gonna be quite tense. Additionally, getting higher up on those quarry spots are gonna be important because you're gonna get points that way. Um, so yeah, there is quite a bit of tension and jockeying for position and getting the most lucrative positions, not only in the quarry, but also in the temples, also getting your statues down, as I said, and getting the cards you want. So everything is gonna be, um, you know, indirectly confrontational, which is, um, which is good and what I like in my Euro game. There's no, there's no um, destructive player interaction, there's nothing like that. However, there is still good tension throughout the game. Um, replayability wise, there's a whole bunch of cards that go in the game. Um, you know, you're never going to see the same lineup, which is quite good. Um, there is um, the, all the different kind of powers the gods give, give you is going to be messed up because it's variable each game. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of variability and the setup is not always going to be exactly the same. So there's always going to be reasons to go back to it, um, which is always good. Um, aesthetically, I really do like the game, the way the game looks. It's very, um, very on par with Teotihuacan in terms of that macro looking down look, you know, where you've got the tiny little people walking around, you can see the big temples and stuff. I do really like that look and aesthetic of the game and it ties in very well with Teotihuacan Teo Khan for the series. And production wise is, is very good as well. I mean, you've got this big plastic obelisk, which I, I suppose it's somewhat functional in kind of moving the, um, the light around, but it's more just kind of a statement piece in terms of table presence. Um, but yeah, quality in general of the components is, is top notch. The only complaint I have is um, that the resources are cardboard chits rather than um, you know wooden you know wooden resources or anything like that. So it would have been nice to have um, you know wooden cubes or something um, rather than the um, th than the cardboard chits. But other than that, I'm really happy with the production, and I think the aesthetic it, aesthetically it's um, very good looking as well. Um, the the theme of the game again very very dry euro but it works you know the the statement piece of the obelisk is just it just works the whole light dark tainted thing is, is really cool um you know the the presence of the game develops as it goes on as you've got all that kind of columns in the in the temple will develop you've got the quarry buildings and the quarries that develop so it's got that it has got a kind of a, a building um civilization kind of feel to it while still being disjointed to that because it's a a dry euro. Um, setup and teardown time as well is, is more than proportionate. There's not too much that goes into it. I suppose the biggest obstacle is um, setting up your player board, but it's still nothing out of the ordinary and nothing too onerous. Um, progression of the game is, is really good to be honest um, because you're going to get more and more of those um, technology cards. You are going to put more of your statues down. So, you know, your engine is constantly building. And when you're placing your columns, um, you are, and when you place a building after that, you can get a whole bunch of points because you're gonna get three points per column you've got when you place a building. Um, so you can really do ramp up in your points as the game goes on. Um, you can work towards those end game cards. So there is, there is a lot to, um, a lot of progression in the game and it does feel like you're getting better and better as the game goes on um, and it's not it's not too stagnant um, scalability is good because um, as I said the spots where you can put your god statues um, is going to get tighter and tighter and tighter to pay, depending on the player count um, so there is it's not too loosey-goosey you know you can do you are restricted and it doesn't feel like you are not treading on each other's feet you know you're always going to be somewhat interacting with one another um, and also, obviously, dice are taken out, taken out of the pool depending on the player count as well. Um, and comparison-wise, um, yeah, it'd be it'd be foolish not to compare this to games like Teotihuacan and games like Zulkan. Um Not because it's ultra similar, but it just has a similar feel to it. You know, it's got that ancient civilization feel to it. Um, the the way it's 
kind of dominated by dice is um, is is you know comparatively similar to that one. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's got familiar tropes of, of dice drafters, but that just initial or additional layer of the scales is makes it unique, and also the yell tainted pure and um, forbidden bit is is really cool as well but yeah overall um, i really enjoyed this game um thing wrong don't get me wrong it's not going to be for everybody because it is towards that heavier end of the scale and i think some people are going to be daunted by the rules or initial rules overhead but once you're getting into playing the game i think it flows quite nicely and um, once you get your head around the round structure and stuff um you know it's not too daunting and it's not too it's not too overwhelming um, I like the way the, how dynamic the dice are, you know, in terms of when you remove that obelisk, they're all going to flip, which can, you know, throw a spanner in the works. There's still tension there in terms of the dice drafting. Um, you know, the, the tension of getting your statues out and so that is all great. Loads of ways to score points. Some of them are um, quite obtuse to um, just probably more inexperienced players um, because not everything in this game is ultra intuitive. Um, however, I think once you've played it one or two times, you're going to get those kind of or shake those cobwebs off, and um, you know it's going to it's going to fall more naturally and going to going to flow more naturally. So yeah, it's one of those that's going to reward repeated plays for me. Um, I think out of the four, I think initially this one's going to be um, probably my least favourite of the four. However, that's that's not a that's not a slight on the game. I think it's a really solid game, and I'm going to really enjoy um, you know sinking my teeth into it and playing it again and again and again because. There is so much to try in this game, um, and you know those other games are amongst my my absolute favourite games of all time. So this one still sits way up there, um, but yeah, out of the four, it's the one I'm initially not as enthused about. Um, however, as I said, I think the more I play it, the more I'm going to enjoy it. I was very much like that with Teotihuacan. Khan. I think initially I was I liked the game, but I didn't love the game, and now I absolutely love the game. So um, I'm hoping this one will be in the same vein as that. Um, again, yeah, just another solid, solid design by um, Toshini and Tertzi. Um, always pretty much my most anticipated games of the year, when, whatever games they, um, they announce. And I've been looking forward to this one since it was announced. And I'm not disappointed at all. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, I think it's going to be really um, appreciated by players who do like those other games. And um, yeah, they're going to get a lot of value out of it. So it's a rock solid game, um, a solid dice drafter. You've got the engine building, you've got the kind of mini game aspect. And um, if all that appeals to you, then you are going to love Tekenyu Obelisk of the Sun. Um, it's going to get a shield of quality for me, which is my new grading system, um, which, you know, is a very strong um, verdict for me. It's about an 8 out of 10. Um, that's, you know, that's that's way up there for me so it's a really solid game and I don't want it to seem like I'm, I'm downplaying how good this is because I, I prefer the other ones but yeah this one is uh, definitely worth trying if you like these other games if you have enjoyed the review uh, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too uh, you can also support me by following me on Instagram or backing me on Patreon and I'll leave the links below for that one um, for everyone else I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board bye